Good afternoon, and thank you for a very generous introduction. Actually, let me start by thanking the Selection Committee for allowing me to be here today to tell you about some of the research activities taking place at our lab at Northwestern University. But before I tell you about what I got to be talking about today, those are the people who actually do the work. As you could see from this picture, diversity is really the hallmark of our team, and I'm so proud to be among those colleagues. Thank few colleagues who helped in the process to get here, and more importantly, thank my wife and my two children for being tremendous support in the last few years. So today I will be telling you about harmful and toxic chemicals. And these things are not new. They've been used since World War I. As you could see from these pictures, protective gear have been designed and used by soldiers and even civilians to protect themselves and their animals in the last 100 years. So you might be asking yourself, why is he standing here telling us about what happened a hundred years ago, what's all this have to do with what's happening right now? If you watch a show called Homeland, last season, (laughs) a CIA agent was able to stop a nerve agent attack that was going to take place in a subway in Berlin, Germany. And again, you have the right to ask the same question again. First, he's telling us about what happened a hundred years ago. Then he's telling us about a fictional show. What all this have to do with reality? If you do a simple Google search, you will find out that these harmful materials have been used several times in the past two years, last of which two weeks ago against civilians in Syria. So it might not be fictional anymore. This is some people's reality. So again, it's not just using small quantities. Warehouses are found full of these harmful chemicals as well. So why are these materials so toxic? We all have an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Among its functions, it allows us to control our muscles, our breathing. However, when an agent goes and attacks that particular enzyme, It stops it from doing its function. At that point, we have no control over our muscles, no control over our breathing, and that leads to death. So the question is, what's the current technology right now? The current technology right now is based on what we call activated carbons or charcoals. Most of us, we actually have in our sinks or refrigerator filtering our water, plus some other chemicals. That means we could do better. And that's what we do here at Northwestern, trying to make the next generation technology to do better. So here, today I will be telling you about some technology that it has the potential not only deactivate and get rid of stockpiles that we are finding in warehouses, it has the potential to be put in those masks for our soldiers who are trying to protect our liberty, to be put on the suit that our soldiers wear, all the way to have the potential to be used as an antidote before even an attack can take place. When I talk today about designer materials for human protection, I'm not really talking about this type. (laughs) I am really talking about what those guys wear when they go into the harmful places. So, what are these materials that we are making here at Northwestern University, just a block away from here, in the building called International Institute of Nanotechnology? But before I tell you about these materials, let me tell you some requirements. For a material to be, to go into a technology, we have to make it simple, but at the same time has to do this sophisticated task. Being able to stop, and degrade nerve agents, that's not a simple task. However, the material itself has to be built from simple components to be able to scale up into a real technology. So the motto on our team and our group always keep it simple. The idea is 
how can we use simple building blocks to make sophisticated material to be able to stop nerve agents from killing us, and at the same time, to be able to scale it up and utilize it in the field. So we all have either, either played, or we know somebody who played, or we all know Tinker Toys, the cousins of Legos. We buy them, very simple components, and in no time, the fifth-year-olds, the six-year-olds, they build some complex structures. The question is, why can't we implement this simple concept into chemistry, but now to build small, tiny molecules? Let's call them nanotinker toys. But the way we want to do it, we don't want to do it one piece at a time. We don't want to just take those pieces and assemble it one piece at a time. We want to be able to take all the ingredients, the metals, the organic molecules, our solvent, and make a soup out of it. Put everything together and allow it to be, to come together in a way to make sophisticated, intricate, beautiful molecules, but in a programmable way. So we're not just going to rely on what God going to give us. We want to be able to predict what we're going to get before we mix those components in that soup. And when they come, they are beautiful structures, as you could see. Different shapes. Here I'm showing in gray, but they are different colors as well. So those molecules come very beautiful and very shiny. But that's not where the action takes place. Where the action takes place is really down in the nano regime. The regime that we cannot even see with our naked eyes. But let's take this crystal and let's dive in, into this, inside this crystal to that little tiny nano molecule. That's the molecule that we will be talking about for the rest of this talk. So, those materials have a technical term. It's called metal organic frameworks because they are built on metals. We have a whole periodic table to choose from. They are built on the organic 200 years, 300 years of chemistry. So here, the question is, which one should we make because we have too many choices to build from? So the idea here, let me talk about one of those molecules that we made here at Northwestern University we call NU100. NU stands for Northwestern University. <laughs> This material, one gram of it, if you are able to unfold all these components and lay them on the ground, it will cover the whole football field or a soccer field with one gram. Just let me tell you what one gram means. It's less than one package of sugar. That's how much surface area we have in such a small volume. So the question is, you might be asking, and who cares? Let me use the air molecules that you are breathing right now as an example. There is more air molecules in your hands, on your skin, on your face than in front of you. That means the more surfaces we have, the more gases we interact, the more harmful molecules we could capture in a small, tiny volume. And that's the trick here. So the idea is, I am passing those models around for you to see. If you look inside that vial, one of those tiny crystallites, it has that many units, one, one, one and 18 zeros in front of it, in one little crystallite. But to put it in perspective, that model is 10 million times larger than reality. And that's why we are able to put 10 to the 18th units in one tiny crystal, that you cannot see those units with your naked eye. So, because we could make those materials with such a high surface area, we could make them programmable on demand. They are great to capture and destroy those nasty chemicals to replace activated carbons to make the next generation sorbent. So, but let's compare moths to something we really all use and understand, a bath sponge. If we have a spill, you take a sponge, and you wipe the water, and it captures all the water. The idea here, how can we make a synthesis 
to make human-made sponges to be able to capture those nasty, harmful chemicals. Let me show you. This is one of the agents. It's really been used in several times in the last couple of years. In order to deactivate it, it's a really simple transformation. Taking molecule on the left to the molecule on the right. It looks simple, but it's very complex to do because you have to do it very quick. Otherwise, it's too late. So we wanted to learn from biology, from nature. Is there anything out there that could do this transformation and do it well? There is a bacteria that lives in farming land. It has an enzyme called phosphotriesterase. This bacteria uses this enzyme to be able to live in the farming land. Why? Because they use pesticides and insecticides in the farming land, and pesticides and insecticides are nothing but nerve agents for pests and insects. So we wanted to learn how this enzyme does it for that bacteria to live. And if you zoom in into where the action site takes place, it's a very simple couple metals. So what do we want it to do is how can we learn from this enzyme and take it into a man-made or a human-made synthesized molecule? Because this enzyme, as great as it is, you take it out of its cozy environment and it dies very quickly. If we try to use this materials in desert, this enzyme dies very quickly. So we want to learn and be inspired from this enzyme but take it into a material that is stable and fast, selective at the same time. What do I mean by that? Let me introduce you to another molecule. It's called VX. We all heard of VX in the last six weeks. This is the molecule that was used to assassinate the stepbrother of the dictator, North Korean dictator. This molecule, to deactivate it, we have to cut it in pieces. However, if you cut in the wrong place, you will make another molecule is just as toxic as VX itself. That means knowing where you cut is just as important as how fast you cut it. So that's the trick here. Let me show you one of the molecules, one of the sponges that we actually discovered in our lab at Northwestern University. It's called NU1000. You see those nice, beautiful channels? That's serin going there, interacting with those metals that we build them from inspiration from that enzyme, and we put them in a material very stable and very rugged. And you could see it taken, chopping that harmful chemical in pieces. Let me show you some data. But this data, not with an actual agent. This data is with a simulant or a surrogate. Because here at Northwestern University, we're not gonna be able testing nerve agents in our labs. So we use something very similar to that to do the testings. You could see generation one, it's okay, it's not great. It took 60 minutes, you have the time there and how much we destroyed, to destroy 80% of the harmful chemical around. We learned from that, we made generation two. Generation two took only 30 minutes to completely destroy the whole sample. Generation three, which we made last year, it took less than a minute to destroy the whole sample. This is really impressive. But the question is, does it work against the actual agent? With collaboration with the Army Labs, we send our, what we call them, bio-inspired sponges. We send it to them. They test them against those nasty chemicals, the harmful VX, the harmful GD, under the conditions we tested our simulants. And what they find, that those materials work exactly the way we envision them to work. This is exciting, that we could now design materials to go beyond what's, the st what's used currently. So, going forward, you could see we have many, many molecules to choose from, many metals to choose from. The question becomes, which one to choose? And that's why we wanna be able to use the chemist intuition with supercomputing and software to be able to predict which components we should put in that sponge before we even go to the lab and make it. So that's the future. But none of that could be useful if we all could make is that vial that is going around few milligrams. If we cannot scale up this technology, we should stop right now. 
A startup company called Numat Technologies in Skokie was able to show that this technology is scalable. So again, that's great news. So here, what I hope to show you and share with you some of the things, some of the research activities that taking place just few buildings from here at Northwestern University. We are inspired and we take our clues from nature. But at the end of the day, we are making more stable, programmable materials that we want to go beyond what nature can. Thank you.